Good morning and welcome to another Rady Live event for the Master of Finance program. Welcome, we are so glad to have you join us this morning. Before we get started, please feel free to use the chat or the question section to let us know if you cannot hear us. And please use that section to pose any questions that you may have as we move through the presentation. We have a lot of information to cover today, but we will reserve time at the end um, for any questions that you may have about the topics that we've covered, or if there's some piece of information that we didn't cover that you're interested in learning more about. So with no further ado, we will begin our Rady Live session for the Master of Finance program, covering the topics of curriculum, finance, and the industry. You are joined today by me, Audrey Phillips. I'm the Assistant Director of Graduate Admissions. And so I work specifically with our prospective students, our applicants. I also work with the Master of Finance Admissions Committee and our admission, admitted students. So I am considered the admissions advisor for the Master of Finance program. I've included my email here. It will also be included later in the slides um, for your reference, if there are any questions that you have after the presentation, I hope that you would reach out to me. And our very exciting special guest for this morning is Professor Michael Melvin. He is the Executive Director of our Master of Finance program. So just to give you an overview of the topics that will be covered today in our Rady Live event, we'll begin by highlighting some of the different aspects of the program. Then we will go through some overview of the faculty. We'll briefly discuss curriculum and the program format, as well as what your career roadmap could look like if you were to enroll in the Master of Finance program. We'll reserve some time to discuss admissions procedures and talk through the ins and outs of the admissions process. And then of course, reserving time at the end for questions and answers. Program highlights for the Master of Finance. The Rady School's mission really guides what we do in the classroom and then for our students once they leave the classroom as well is to develop ethical and entrepreneurial leaders who make a positive impact in the world through innovation, collaboration, and knowledge. You may notice that there are four words underlined in our mission statement. Those relate directly back to the statement of purpose that is a part of our admissions process. I'll speak more on that later. And now I will turn it over to Executive Director Michael Melvin. All right, thank you, Audrey, and welcome everyone. So our program is a young program. It is five years old, and it was started in the aftermath of the financial crisis. It's a one-year quantitative finance program. So we emphasize quantitative methods. <clears throat> this would include data science, uh, empirical analysis and financial econometrics. So our goal is to train students to have the skills to go to work for leading firms in the industry using cutting edge techniques of analysis. So this program is designed to serve the current needs of industry and we constantly evolve the program in order to stay current so that we are sending students out to the market with the skills that industry asks for. So before I joined this program, I was uh, leading quantitative research teams at BlackRock, which is the world's largest asset management company. And so the kinds of students we are producing are the kinds of people that I wanted to hire for my team at BlackRock. Really smart people with current skills that we want to employ for decision making. And before that, I was a professor. So I've been a, an academic, then an industry for 11 years, and now back in academia. So we are a STEM designated program. This is particularly relevant for international students because it allows them up to three years of practical training so that they 
will not be sent home after one year following their degree. So employers are much more willing to hire students from STEM programs. I know at BlackRock, they will only hire international students who graduate from a STEM program because if they are not in a STEM program, they only have one year of practical training and they may not be able to obtain a visa to allow them to stay. And so BlackRock only hires students from STEM programs because BlackRock knows that within three years, they'll certainly get their visa and will be able to remain and work. Mm -hmm. We also are affiliated with the CFA and the GARP. The CFA is the Chartered Financial Analyst Association. And many people in the industry want a CFA designation. This comes about by passing uh, exams that are required for CFA designation. And uh, we actually have CFA prep courses in our program that count as credit as an elective. And then the GARP is the Global Association of Risk Professionals. So for risk managers in finance, uh, the GARP is their professional association. And so there are benefits for our students of these affiliations. Both the CFA and the GARP have competitions that our students can enter. Uh, we also are awarded some scholarships that uh, pay the registration fees for the exams that our students can apply for. So there are benefits to being CFA and GARP affiliated. Next slide, please. So this, the industry has evolved fairly quickly from the old days where it was much more traditional finance, looking at uh, you know, a lot of pieces of paper with financial statements and creating sort of informally portfolios and then moving to quantitative models and uh, nowadays use of big data and processing unstructured data. So financial analytics has changed rapidly. And as I said earlier, we constantly evolve our program to stay on the cutting edge. So, you know, we have a three fall course, a winter course and a spring course that relate to data science applied to finance. So our students learn how to uh, apply techniques of analysis to unstructured data, to textual data. They learn machine learning techniques applied to financial modeling, uh, and then also financial econometrics, learning how to create and estimate financial models. And there are many new areas of finance that uh, are opening, I won't say continuously, but fairly rapidly. And we keep an eye on the market where I'm constantly talking with people in the industry. So we stay on top of what they're looking for and the skills that they want. Next slide, please. So what do we think industry wants? Well, I know what I'm told. They want to have people who can analyze large data sets, they want to have people who know financial modeling and who can create and uh, implement financial models. Uh, there's a big demand for risk management skills. I know when I was at BlackRock, risk management was maybe the fastest growing area in the firm that uh, people were hired in large numbers to help manage the risk of all the investment teams within the firm. They want people who know how to think about different scenarios, like if this happens, what do we do? And be able to think about the implications of these various scenarios, like if the Federal Reserve starts tapering their bond purchases, what are the implications for equities? And of course, the Federal Reserve yesterday announced they would begin tapering their bond purchases. And so having insights into these kinds of scenarios and the implications are very important for risk management, but also for investment decision making. And then having computational expertise to solve financial problems, complex problems. And not all students in our program want to 
become experts in all of these areas, but we offer the courses to allow them to follow their interests in order to develop the expertise that is needed in the areas that they are interested in. Next slide, please. Uh, let's see here. The uh, our, our program is an applied program, so we have uh, techniques that you will be actually using. Yes, there are some courses that have finance theory in them, but this is not a course in theory. Our Master of Finance program is a quantitative applied program that will give you skills to directly use. So. There may be some classes that have some finance theory, but it's very much an applied program. So we know how important data is today and how important it is for our students to be able to uh, find data, download data, extract data from websites, process the data, model with the data and draw conclusions. So mainly the coding language that we use is Python because that's pretty much the dominant coding language in finance nowadays. And if a student has no experience coding in Python, that's fine. In the summer before you start, next summer, we have a recommended four course sequence in DataCamp to bring all students up to speed before they start in the fall. So it's certainly not a prerequisite and you will learn more in the program as you proceed through the program. You'll have projects in your classes that will give you opportunities to apply what you're learning, to do your own coding on your own problems. And the faculty I will talk about in more detail in just a minute. The faculty, uh, some of our faculty are juniors who are relatively new. Others are senior and very famous people in the field of finance. And then lastly, we'll be talking about careers and we have a career services center and all that they do to help you get ready for your career to find a great job. Next slide, please. Okay, and then for outcomes, I mean, when you think about outcomes, you think about what's in it for me when I finish the program. And so there are various career paths. Pretty much our students have gone in all areas of finance, as you will see, uh, and the data science knowledge that they have uh, and the emphasis on quantitative models leads some to go into research positions or even data science positions. Uh, students take jobs as financial analysts, investment uh, officers, uh, career paths where you could ultimately end up would be a chief investment officer who leads a portfolio team, uh, investment team, or a chief risk officer that oversees the risk of an entire firm. Chief finance officer, we have students going into corporate finance at non-financial corporations, and those can be wonderful careers. Investment researchers that uh, you know are always looking for new ideas and processing data, looking for new trading signals and more efficient ways to trade. So students can go to banks, investment banks, uh, asset management companies, mutual funds, insurance companies, hedge funds, non-financial corporations, notice large is crossed out, both large and small, our students have gone to both, and credit rating agencies and regulators, so like Moody's, for instance, where we have one of our alums in San Francisco. Next slide, please. Let's talk about the faculty. So the faculty come from uh, fine universities. They've got great backgrounds and they're publishing cutting edge research papers in the top academic journals. So just very quickly looking down the list, we have Joey Engelberg. Joey teaches a course in behavioral finance in the Master of Finance program. That's his expertise. In fact, he's one of the world's experts in behavioral finance and has published a number of highly cited and very well-known papers. We have Harry Markowitz, 
who is a Nobel Prize winner in finance and generally called the father of modern finance, started with him back in the 50s. Uh, he's retired. He's still around. And actually, I had lunch with him a few weeks ago, and he said he wants to come in and meet with all the students in the Master of Finance program during the winter quarter. And so I teach something called professional seminar in the winter quarter, and I'll have Harry come in and speak with the class. And it's always a lot of fun and very interesting to hear uh, about his past and his views on things. Braden Brian Drish, uh, he's an assistant professor of finance, a PhD from Berkeley. He was on the faculty of Stanford University before he joined us. Professor June Liu, uh, June's PhD from Stanford in finance. He was on the faculty of UCLA before he left uh, them to join us. Uh, me, so I uh, PhD from UCLA. I joined here from BlackRock, as I said, my field is international finance. I should have said Professor Brian Drish, his field is uh, finance theory and uh, uh, corporate finance and derivatives, and he teaches classes in corporate finance and derivatives uh, for us in the Master of Finance program. Uh, Professor Jun Liu teaches a class called Stochastic Calculus and Continuous Time Finance. And really, he likes to say that course should be called asset pricing because he's teaching students how to model asset prices in that class. And me, I teach the last class you would take, the Capstone Independent Research course, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And I also teach the Winter Quarter Professional Seminar. And uh, as my field of research, as I said, is international finance and particularly the foreign exchange market. Next slide, please. Will Mullins is an assistant professor of finance, a PhD from MIT. He joined us from the faculty of the University of Maryland uh, before leaving them to come to UC San Diego. Uh, his specialty is uh, banking and financial institutions. He teaches a course called valuation. Uh, how do you value firms? Like, how do I know if a firm's stock price is fairly priced or undervalued or overvalued? Very popular course, uh, his master of finance class. Rick Townsend, PhD from Harvard University. Uh, he teaches new venture finance. So he's interested in venture capital and financing new businesses. Uh, has a number of very well-known papers and for such a junior faculty member has become quite prominent and distinguished. Michael Rayer teaches one of the required courses in the first quarter in the fall. He teaches a course on uh, financial data analysis and he joined us from Harvard University just a couple of years ago. Snehal Banerjee, PhD from Stanford, he was on the faculty of the Kellogg School at Northwestern University before joining us here at UC San Diego. So he's interested in finance theory and uh, the microstructure and uh, asymmetric information models. He teaches uh, to MBA students introduction to finance and investments. Alan Timmerman, very famous finance professor, very well known, many famous papers, well cited. He teaches uh, the fall course to the Master of Finance class in investments, and then he teaches an elective course, business forecasting. So PhD from Cambridge, Ross Valkanoff, another one of the senior faculty, very well known finance faculty member. PhD from Princeton. He was on the faculty of UCLA before he left UCLA to join us. And he teaches two classes in the Master of Finance program also. He teaches the fall required course, Financial Econometrics and Empirical Methods. And he teaches the winter required course, Advanced Financial Risk Management. Next slide, please. I think this goes back to you, Audrey. Yes, thank you so much, Michael. 
Um, so we're going to discuss a little bit more in depth about our curriculum as well as the format of the program. So our Master of Finance curriculum does have a very strong emphasis on empirical data-driven methods. It is a full-time one-year program that takes four quarters and is comprised of 52 credits or 52 units. The program develops skilled professionals prepared to address the significant challenges facing the financial sector. The core courses that Professor Melvin mentioned earlier do comprise 16 credits of the program. The first is an investment analysis, collecting and analyzing financial data, advanced financial risk management, and then finally, our financial econometrics and empirical methods. I'll turn it back over to Professor Melvin. Okay, the electives allow you to follow your interest. We have a selection. They may vary a little every year. Uh, most are offered every year. One quarter a year, they will be offered. Uh, but sometimes we'll have a new one being offered, sometimes one won't be offered. It, it varies a little, but generally these are the electives that will be offered every year. So investing in private markets is one that we just taught last year. Uh, it may not be taught every year, but uh, it, it could be valuation in corporate finance, very popular class taught every year. Behavioral finance, very popular class. New venture finance, derivatives and structured finance. Uh, again, a regular class offered every year. Financial markets and institutions, same thing. Asset management, corporate finance. Fixed income is one that uh, we offered for the first time last year. And maybe it'll be offered this year. It may not be offered every year current topics in finance, these vary. So current topics in finance uh, can include uh, things like uh, the Federal Reserve policy, for instance, right now monetary policy at the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England. Central bank policy is always newsworthy, but particularly in the headlines these days. So if we offered a current topics in finance course this year, we'd probably have at least a significant portion addressed to uh, central bank policy and implications for financial markets, stochastic calculus and continuous time finance, otherwise known as asset pricing. Uh, that's offered every year. Data science for finance using Python. Data science for finance is now a two-course sequence. There's a winter quarter elective followed by a spring quarter elective. The winter quarter data science class focuses on uh, basically data science as a field and then more narrowly uh, analysis of unstructured data and textual analysis like natural language processing where you extract uh, information out of textual data that you can then use to process and model for some financial ends. The second quarter of data science for finance is machine learning applications to financial uh, issues. Computational finance methods, uh, by the way, the data science for finance classes are taught by computer scientists. Uh, very close to the Rady School of Management is a building that houses the San Diego Supercomputer Center. And uh, data scientists and computer scientists from the Supercomputer Center teach the data science for finance class. So these are people on the frontiers of data science who uh, are very much on top of where that area is heading and are contributing to furthering that field. Computational finance methods is taught by two professors of mathematics. And so in, in this class, the students learn mathematical applications for things like uh, pricing options and uh, other interesting financial applications. Then we have uh, an elective for CFA exam preparation. So we have a great instructor to help students get ready for the CFA exam. 
and you get credit for an elective for taking that class, then all students will take the professional seminar that I teach in the winter quarter. This is a one unit class where very senior people from the industry come in and talk about their careers, their career path, uh, current challenges their, their firm is facing. So these are like CIOs, chief investment officers, CEOs, chief executive officers, very senior people in the industry. And then there's a professional communication and finance one unit class which talks uh, specializes in written and oral communication to help the students develop better communication skills. In addition, there are accounting electives that are very popular. In the fall quarter, there's a financial accounting class that pretty much all students take. And then there's, in the winter quarter, a financial statement analysis class that is also quite popular. Next slide, please. And then at the end of your program, the last class you take is the Capstone Independent Research class. So I teach this class, and this class gives you the opportunity to now use all the skills that you've learned. So it will be an empirical project. What I do is I get project ideas from business firms so that you work on a project that really matters and people care about. So I'll go to a firm, and I'll say, is there something you'd like to see researched, but you don't have the time or the resources to do it yourself? Give me the idea and I'll have a team of four smart students work on this. They'll do the research, write a research report, and that will be what I will grade for their grade in the capstone project. And pretty much all firms that I contact uh, are interested in participating and we've done projects in all areas of finance with large global firms like uh, Goldman Sachs or Deutsche Bank or UBS or BlackRock. We've done projects with small local firms like Encore Capital or Altegris, firms that are here in the San Diego area. So uh, the list of firms is quite long. On this slide, you see a short subsample of that list. And this is this has proven to be very useful for the students. It looks great on their resume when a student says, you know, I did this uh, applied project with uh, Goldman Sachs on algorithmic trading in the foreign exchange market or, or some other topic. So it shows that you have the ability to do real research that the industry cares about. Next slide, please. So here's a list of some former topics that we've done in the program. You know, right now the capstone class is going and uh, we've got a completely different list of projects, but you can see we've done investment oriented projects. We've done risk management oriented projects. We've done corporate finance oriented projects, uh, you name it, and we've worked on. We've done high frequency trading projects, like right now we've got a couple of those going. Right now it's very popular for ESG investing, that's environmental, social, and governance investing. That's been the hottest area in uh, asset management for the past few years and it's still a very popular area so we have a few projects going this fall that are related to ESG investing and we've been working on similar projects in recent years. It seems like many firms have research needs in that area and our students are able to work on quite relevant and timely topics. Next slide please. Back to Audrey. Thank you, Professor Melvin. So we've talked a little bit about the different kinds of courses that you will take, but we wanted to give you an overview of how those courses would be scheduled out. And you do have two options as a student. I mentioned before that the program is four quarters long and takes a year, um, but there are two different ways that you can structure your classes. Um, for either of those schedules. You will begin with some pre-term orientation and a few courses uh, just in advance of the start of the program. When our fall quarter begins in 2022, students will be taking um, four classes. Three of those are the core courses, collecting and analyzing financial data. 
investment analysis, financial econometrics and empirical methods. And then the fourth is an elective. As Professor Melvin mentioned, many students, if not all, will end up taking financial accounting. That has been a very popular course in the past. When the winter quarter begins in 2023, that will be the time that students take the fourth of the core courses, Advanced Financial Risk Management. And then this kind of marks the beginning of a student's time to really build out their, their elective courses to fit their interests and their career goals as well. The winter and the spring quarter are primarily filled with elective courses, but they also have professional seminars. One of those, as Professor Melvin mentioned, is the one where we discuss um, current topics where we have different professionals from the industry come in and share um, their backgrounds and their career trajectories. And the other is um, communications in finance. And then I'll come to the last part, our capstone project. That often takes place in the summer quarter for students. And you'll see in this slide, it shows next to Capstone Project a plus, and it says internship question mark. Some students will decide to take their Capstone Project during the summer quarter. They may also at the same time be engaged in an internship. That is certainly an option for you as you're thinking through what the program scheduling may look like, or you may choose the second option. For the second option, you'll see the first quarters look the same pre-term, fall quarter, winter, spring. And then for the summer quarter, many students will choose to focus entirely on the internship and then push back the capstone project until the fall quarter. So it's the same number of units, the 52 credits that we've talked about. It's the same amount of time for quarters, but there's this break for the summer quarter to engage fully in the internship. It is a student's choice whether they would like to complete the program in the summer quarter or the fall quarter. Um, and in past years, it's ended up being about a third of the students who will take the capstone in the summer and about two thirds who opt to take it in the fall. Of course, each year is slightly different. Right, and then we're going to delve a little bit more deeply into what your career might look like after the Master of Finance program. And I will turn it back over to Director Melvin. Okay, where do our students go? I mean, most students come here because they want a job. Overwhelmingly, that's why students come to the program, they want a job. There are a few students who come to our program and decide they want to pursue a PhD in finance or accounting or economics typically. And every year there are two or three graduates who wanna go on to PhD programs and they've gone to top programs. <clears throat> so we have students who have gone, excuse me, we have students who have gone to UC San Diego for a PhD, to, we have a student right now at Stanford, we have one of our master finance alums at the University of Chicago, another one at Columbia. They've gone to top programs, those who do go on for PhDs but overwhelmingly the large numbers of our graduates want a job. And some have taken jobs here in San Diego or in the Southern California area with local firms and stuff like non-financial firms like Qualcomm, which is, you know, builds computer chips and uh, Viasat, which is a satellite communications company. So they've gone into corporate finance at those jobs. Others have gone into investment jobs like at Stepstone Group, which is a, a, a private equity fund of funds, uh, or at uh, Denali Capital, which is a small hedge fund, or Girton Municipal Bond Management, which is a bond uh, asset manager. So some students have gone outside of San Diego. Most, in fact, go outside of San Diego and they've gone all over the place. So we have students who have taken jobs uh, across the US. We have students, San Francisco is particularly, uh, I guess has a cluster of our alums who have taken jobs in the San Francisco Bay Area, but we have students in China, we have students in Europe, we have students in Latin America, and they've gone to work in all sorts of industries. Some have gone to large global institutions. Uh, others have gone to smaller firms 
in like a regional firm in a particular area of the U.S. or a particular country. Some have gone into asset management, others have gone into risk management, others have gone into consulting. Like we have a student right now in, who's in uh, Shanghai working for Deloitte and he is in a consulting area. So he is in a financial risk management consulting area for Deloitte. And he sent an email to me recently saying, we're doing a lot of hiring. We want to hire four more people. Please send me the list of current students so we can try and hire four more from the Rady School Master of Finance program. So it's great when our alums uh, get out there in the industry and then have openings and come back to hire more of their new classmates who are graduating now. Next slide, please. So they've taken positions in all areas of finance. As I said earlier, here are some of the job titles, uh, financial analyst, investment analyst, business analyst, senior data analyst. Some just go into straight data science jobs, like a recent grad is working for Disney in Anaheim, California, as a data scientist processing trying to extract information from people attending Disneyland and Walt Disney World and the Disney theme parks around the world. Research analyst, risk assurance analyst, asset management, wealth manager, that's an area we haven't spoken of yet. What does a wealth manager do? A wealth manager manages money for very wealthy people. So someone who has managed to accumulate a lot of wealth, but doesn't really have expertise in finance, they hire people to manage their money for them. And so we have had a number of students go into that area where they're working for a wealth management firm. And there are some very big ones around the world like Credit Suisse or UBS or Morgan Stanley and so on. So, and there are smaller ones locally where we've had students take jobs with smaller wealth managers. Uh, development fund manager and risk manager. Risk manager, as we've talked about a couple of times already, is managing the financial risks of the firm. And as I said, they've gone to all areas in terms of all in, uh, types of financial institutions. We have students at private equity firms. We have students at large financial corporations, small non-financial corporations credit rating agencies, investment banks, uh, banks, asset management companies. So, you know, the students have, have really spread out into many different interesting areas. And like we have, it's interesting because it seems like once one of our students gets established somewhere, it creates a pipeline for new students. Like we had one woman who was originally from China who took a job with an equity consulting firm in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, and the state right next to California. And then next thing you know, they hired another woman, and now they're hiring another woman. And so it's uh, like once someone gets in the door, then they open up the pipeline for other master of finance students to uh, get jobs in that firm. And it's great for the students to have these kinds of opportunities. Next slide, please. So, I mean, we've already said the students have gone all over the place. This, these are some prominent firms and less prominent firms where students have taken jobs recently. So, you know, the, the job market is pretty good in finance these days and pretty good in most areas, I guess, right now. And it's great to see the students uh, landing good jobs and going out there to work after they do all the hard work, spending their year here in the program. Next slide, please. And I think back to Audrey. Yes, thank you, Professor Melvin. So this, of course, is primarily a program for students who are looking to enter into into um, not necessarily continuing their education, but entering into the field of employment directly afterwards. So being a professional program, it is important to think about what will careers look like and what kind of support will I receive if I decide to enroll at Rady. 
So our Rady Career Connections team, they are there to support students all along the way, and they have developed this sort of career roadmap for students to um, kind of provide a loose framework for thinking about how to build up to your ultimate career goals. The first, of course, is to define your fit based on your interests, align and execute your plan, and then also to refine and market your plan and ultimately to launch your career. To define the fit, this is usually going to be um, working directly with the career advisor for the Master of Finance program. This is going to be creating a resume for Rady and it will be reviewed um, by our advisor and also in VMOC. Setting up your careers profile for Rady and also signing up for group advising with your career consultant. And there's the optional piece of completing the soft skills and values assessment. So all of that is kind of helping to discern what is going to be my fit in the field of finance. For aligning and executing your plan, there's going to be a little bit more that goes into that, of course, along with the support of our careers department. Each year, this looks slightly different because as we are continuing to grow and evolve as um, an institution, we're also looking at how can we be more of the moment with our careers department. Um, LinkedIn, of course, and using social media as a way to develop professionally. Uh, and then working to refine and market the plan. Kind of becoming more specific, tailoring your resume, tailoring your LinkedIn profile, connecting with your network, applying to jobs and internships, and very important in this section is scheduling a mock interview with the careers department. That is something that has been very helpful for students as they're beginning to move towards the next step of launching their career. Um, we have worker, we have different kind of connections in our careers office who will help you with discussing offers, salary negotiation, um, and we also have a session that is typically offered on salary negotiation. So a lot of different ways to help guide you from the very beginning as you're exploring what might be a good fit for you to finally deciding to take the job offer. In the Career Management Center, there's kind of two roles. There's the internal role that's really focusing completely on our students, and then the external role of promoting the Rady School of Management to companies and prospective employers. Internally for our students, of course, the mock interviews that I mentioned earlier, working on resumes, salary negotiation. In previous years, prior to COVID, we would offer treks up to San Francisco. Um, preparing students who are international students, thinking about visa implications of um, gaining employment in the United States after graduation. They also offer a variety of networking opportunities, speaker series, and also career workshops that are targeted for our students to help build your professional skill set. And then externally, facing the outward community, they are working to promote the value of a Rady education, career fairs, those treks also are really helpful for um, promoting Rady to the prospective employers. Um, figuring ways to match the organizational need with our student skills. And again, those networking opportunities, employer panels, and providing access to the student resume. So kind of this twofold role for our Career Management Center. And then as we transition, we're kind of going back to the beginning to talk about the admissions procedures. So our admissions process for the Master of Finance program at the Rady School of Management, we do review applications on a rolling basis. So as soon as an application comes in and is complete with all of the supporting documents, we will begin to review it. But we do have these application round deadlines throughout the course of the admission cycle. And these are designed to give students kind of a good option and a deadline to think through. Our first deadline was on October 15th, but the latest and most upcoming one is December 1st. Um, we do have another deadline for our third round on January 15th. And then I want to draw your attention to the final two dates that are listed, April 15th and May 1st. These are hard deadlines. For April 15th, that is the final deadline for any student who is an international applicant. And it is also the deadline for specialty fellowship consideration. 
We do have the absolute final deadline of May 1st for domestic students. And those are really hard set in stone. If you were to apply on and submit your application on April 17th, but you're an international student, we would not be able to review your file. So I encourage you to really pay attention to those final deadlines. And then just thinking about the application pr process overall and the timing, we really encourage students to apply earlier in the cycle. The Master of Finance program at the Rady School of Management is a highly competitive program. We have a limited number of spots that are available for students each year. And we find that it's really helpful for students to apply earlier in the cycle that gives you a really great opportunity for um, full consideration. We really hate to see if the spots have filled up towards the end of the program. That's just not something that we want a student to be in that sort of position. So we recommend the earlier, the better, as long as you feel like you have a strong application. In terms of what different documentation we need from you, the first is our online application. Uh, that is available on our website. We have a number of different buttons that say apply now or start your application. Any of those will take you to our application system. The application itself is primarily going to be biographical information. So where are you from? What schools did you attend? Um, but it also does have a few pieces that are more short answer questions that will ask you to um, assess some of your level of comfortability with a variety of different quantitative methods, um, and also share a little bit more background information about you. Additionally, when you submit the application, we also will ask that you attach a copy of all transcripts. So if you've done undergraduate work at multiple institutions, or if you do have some graduate level work as well, we ask for copies of all of those transcripts, and we do need those to be translated into English as well if you've gone to an institution in another country where English is not the uh, primary language that the transcripts will come in. We will accept electronic copies, and I think the piece that is very important here is that during the admissions process, we will accept unofficial copies of your transcript. Um, if you have requested an official transcript before from your undergraduate institution's registrar, you know that sometimes that can be a lengthy process. It can take some time to get the official copy. So the unofficial is a really nice way for us to keep things moving. What I will say is if you were to decide that you did want to attend the Master of Finance program, if you are admitted, um, we would require an official copy of the transcript with the date of your degree conferral um, if you decide to enroll at the institution. But that's much further down the line for admissions. All that we need is that unofficial transcript. We also ask for a statement of purpose. That's kind of your personal statement essay. But what I will say that is very important about this is that it does have a specific prompt attached to it. It is not just kind of an overall tell us about yourself. Um, and so one of the things that we look for is did the student actually read the question and are they answering the question? I referenced this a bit earlier when I talked about our mission statement. Our statement of purpose asks you to take one of those four words and to talk about um, how two of those different words have impacted you either academically, professionally. Um, and so it helps us to get an, a better idea of who you are and how you would fit in at the Rady School of Management. We also ask for you to submit a current copy of your resume or CV. And there is no specific format that we require, but there is um, a template in the application if you don't have a preferred format that you've used before. And then the other piece of this line that is important is those two recommendations. I recommend as soon as you begin your application to go to the section on recommendations fill out the contact information for the two who have agreed to write a recommendation for you, and you'll hit submit or save and submit on that portion of the application. Immediately, our system will then send to your recommenders the form that we ask for them to fill out. And the reason I say to do that first is your faculty members, if you're working with them, or if it's a professional reference, they often have a lot of other um, items that they're working on. And so this gives a little bit more time um, so that by the time you're 
completing your application. We're not waiting for a long time on recommendations. Um, if you do find that for whatever reason they're not receiving the form, you can reach out to us and we'll work with you to make sure that they are getting everything that they need. And what we're also looking for throughout the application, throughout your statement of purpose, your transcript, um, your recommendations, your resume, is a demonstration of sufficient quantitative background. As Professor Melvin has said many times, um, this is a very technical, very highly quantitative program, and we want to make sure that we're admitting students who are going to be successful in this program. We also do require either the GMAT or the GRE. We do not have a preference between those two tests, but when you're applying for this upcoming admission cycle, we do require that you share one of those two tests. Now your scores are valid for five years, um, so if you took it last year, you could also use those scores. We do have an English proficiency testing requirement, um, the TOEFL or the IELTS, and those are valid for two years. Um, I've included the link here for graduate divisions requirements for international students regarding English proficiency. Um, essentially for international students, we do require either the TOEFL or the IELTS so that we can see that you have um, the capability to be successful in our classes. If you do have specific questions about um, how to demonstrate proficiency, please feel free to um, add that as a question or you can reach out to me separately about that as well. As I mentioned earlier, our applications are reviewed on a rolling basis. So as they come in and we receive all the documents, you're placed into a queue, and then um, we begin to review based on how early the application came in. We do have an interview by invitation only, and that is for our Cura platform. It is an online platform, so you can complete the interview um, when is ever is most convenient to you. And that's very helpful if um, there's international students and we're not in the same time zone. Um, it's a fairly simple process. Uh, you do have 10 days to complete it. Um, if you want an answer from us earlier, I suggest um, completing the interview on the early end of those 10 days. Um, but you, of course, have those full 10 days to complete the interview. So you may be wondering, well, what makes a great Master of Finance applicant? The strong quantitative background that we've talked about earlier, but also employability. If this is a professional program, and we do want to make sure that we are setting students up for success when they graduate. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the class that just entered this year in 2022. Um, it's our class of 2022. They entered in the fall of 2021. Our total enrollment, this is a larger class than typically we have. We're usually looking at around 145 students. Um, this year, because of COVID, we had a number of deferrals from the previous year, so a slightly larger class than we're used to, but usually we're looking right at about 145. Um, the average age of our students, 23, usually it hovers right around there. We have a number of students who will come directly from their undergraduate education. Um, but we also have some who will be coming in with full-time work experience and we really appreciate having diversity that can enhance the classroom experience for our students. You'll see here too a pie chart of sort of what undergraduate major students are coming in with. You'll see the majority, which is probably not unexpected, a lot of students coming from finance, economics, business, makes sense, we are a finance program. But you'll also see that we have a number of students coming in with mathematics, statistics backgrounds, engineering, science backgrounds. And I've we've mentioned earlier too that quantitative piece, a lot of students who have those strong quantitative backgrounds, students who um, have majored in mathematics or engineering, they tend to be drawn to this program as well. And now I also want to show you that green sliver, it's other, so if you are not seeing your undergraduate major represented on this pie chart, please do not be discouraged. We have had students who come in with a major that may not be directly related to the topics that we'll be covering, who end up being some of the strongest students. Um, what we hope to see on your application is that you have the skills necessary to do very well in our program. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you must have a certain undergraduate major. However, 
we do find that students who are coming in with strong quantitative background, whether that be in their undergraduate major or in other ways evidenced on their transcript or um, the in standardized test scores, that is very helpful for us as we're looking at um, the profile of a student that would be successful in the program. So I'd like to draw your attention to the right side of the screen to kind of the scores. Our median for the GMAT was 700. So you can see our students tend to score very highly on um, that standardized test. The average GPA for the students coming in was 3.44. And the average score for the TOEFL was about 103. So again, our students tend to score very highly and tend to come from very strong academic backgrounds. I also want to draw your attention to the GMAT and the GRE want percentile. Um, the average for the GMAT was an 86th percentile and the average for the GRE was 91st percentile. So again, our students tend to have a very strong quantitative background evidence on their applications. It is a very diverse class in terms of the different countries that have been represented. We of course have students coming from the United States, which is where we are located, but this past year we have students from Armenia, China, Colombia, France, India, Japan, Kazakhstan, the Netherlands, Russia, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, and Vietnam. And we're really excited to bring this unique international perspective to our classroom. In terms of other pieces of background, 10 of these students held an advanced master's degree prior to entering the Master of Finance program. And 13% had full-time work experience ranging anywhere from five to 200 months. So a very diverse and interesting group that just entered this fall. Of course, each year is slightly different, but this can give you an idea of the kinds of students who are admitted and end up enrolling in our program. Right, financing. So we do offer a number of different fellowship opportunities. The first is the Rady Scholar Fellowship, and this is a merit-based fellowship. When a student applies for the program, uh, they go through the admissions committee, we evaluate whether or not a student um, is a good fit for the program, whether or not we feel they should be nominated to the program. And then separately, there is fellowship consideration. Um, and we do our best to issue those decisions around the same time that the student will receive the admissions decision. We recognize that um, thinking about how to pay for your graduate education is an important part of the decision making. So we want to make sure that we're notifying you as soon as possible. And all students will be considered based on their background, um, whether or not they qualify for that merit-based um, fellowship. Additionally, we do have a UC fellowship, and this is for graduates of all UC schools, including, of course, UC San Diego, and that is an automatic $10,000 UC fellowship that if you are admitted and have, been, have graduated from a UC school, you would automatically receive. Additionally, students have found um, that they can find financial support elsewhere, um, some employers will support a student's decision to um, enroll in the Master of Finance program, not just in the sense of um, morale and support, but also put some financial backing behind it. Um, there are also a number of educational loans that are available for students. For domestic students, U.S. citizens and permanent re residents, there is the free application for federal student aid, the FAFSA. That's for federal unsubsidized loans. I've included their website here. And our financial aid office at UC San Diego is able to assist students through that process. Additionally, there are private loans that are available. And if you do decide that you would like to enroll at, in our Master of Finance program, we have a, num a list of different loan organizations that we worked with before. And a few that we are aware of um, who do not require that um, there is a co-signer for international students. So a lot of things to consider once you get to that point. All right, so we are kind of coming up right at the end of our time together. I have included my email address here. If you do have any questions that we may not be able to get to today, 
going to open up to the section. Um, and I actually do not see any questions today. So, Professor Melvin, we must have just done such a fantastic job that there are no questions left. Uh -huh. Well, you know, questions I'm sure may come up. So as Audrey says, please send her a message and uh, she can certainly relay any messages to me as well. We're here to help and we want to make sure that if you do have any questions, we take care of them. But yeah, nothing is in the chat. The chat is empty. So it looks like uh, we have reached our time and I want to thank everyone for attending. Yes, thank you so much for coming and joining us today to learn a little bit more about the program and what potential you have afterwards. Again, my email address is right here and I hope to hear from you all. I wish you a wonderful day.